Hi, everybody. Good afternoon once again. My name is Joe Tomsky, and I'm the Senior Director of Philanthropy here at Sanford Burnham Premise. Today, we have a unique insights for you. For one thing, two of our presenters are overseas in Turkey, so we are truly international uh, today. For most of our programs, we like to give a broad perspective of our topics. This time, though, we're going to go deeper. We've asked the scientists in one lab, that of Svasti Harasharan, to take us through the work that they are doing. What this work paints is a portrait of research being done at all different points in the scientific process. And what we'll see is how everything complements everything else. Before we begin, I would like to mention that this will be my last turn hosting Insights. I have accepted a new position and will be leaving Sanford Burnham Previs. Insights, of course, will continue with new hosts. And I just want to say it has been my pleasure to give you a peek into the amazing science that we do here at the Institute, and it has been an absolute honor working with our researchers. I sincerely hope that you will continue to support this research with your philanthropy and help us change the world. Okay, back to the task at hand. As always, if during or after the presentations you have questions for our scientists, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to ask them at any time. We will then present them when it is appropriate. So let's get started. Our first presenter is Dr. Alaran Mazumder. Dr. Mazumder is a postdoctoral associate in Dr. Harasharan's lab within the Aging, Cancer, and Immuno-Oncology program. His research interest is to develop patient-specific targeted treatments for ER-positive breast cancer patients. Alaran, thank you so much for joining us today. Please go ahead with your presentation. Well, thank you once again for giving us your time and uh, uh, giving us the opportunity to, to present how we are contributing in the field of breast cancer. So what I was saying is that uh, if we see from the point where we stand today, it seems that we have achieved quite a lot when it comes to cancer. So if we look back, 1971 was the year when uh, war on cancer was declared. That was uh, the first initiative that was taken by the US government. And since that time to more recently in 2016, when cancer moonshot was announced. Today, we have 14 million cancer survivors. The survival rates uh, improved by 27%. And most importantly, today, we have a lot many treatment options with us than what we had before. So let's see how the face of cancer actually changed over the years or how our understanding of cancer actually changed. So let's see uh, it, how it was uh, initially. So if we look back in 1940s, around that time, cancer was completely an unknown entity. Basically, nothing was known about this disease. Slowly, slowly, we started to learn more about cancer. And in 1980, there was a big boon with the emergence of targeted therapy. What is a targeted therapy? Targeted therapies are the drugs or the inhibitors that actually function as roadblocks in the route that drives cancer. And also, it is very important to mention over here that what we know today about cancer or the discoveries that were made in cancer, actually a lot of it comes from uh, the studies or the research that was initially conducted in the field of breast cancer. So basically while we were learning about breast cancer, we were not only learning that, but we were actually learning more about cancer in general. 2009, 2010, we were introduced to a new concept that cancer is a heterogeneous disease. What does this mean? It means that cancer is not a single disease or two cancer cells can behave very differently from one another. In a broader context, it means that two cancer patients, although they have same cancer, can behave very differently from one another. It was near about the same time around 2010 that we were also introduced to how our immune system, that is our own bodies, defense mechanism is bypassed by the cancer cells when they spread in the body. Thankfully, today we have the technology where we can actually engineer these cells to find and kill cancer cells in a more efficient manner. So in the previous slide, we learned that cancer is a heterogeneous disease, meaning that not all cancer patients are exactly same, irrespective of the cancer type. So let's take the example of breast cancer. It means that not all breast cancer patients are exactly the same. So if we treat these patients following the principle of one size fits all, that means we try to give one drug to all breast cancer patients, 
only a handful of patients will have the benefit. Some patients will have moderate benefit. Some patients will have absolutely no benefit at all. So this introduces us to a new concept that is precision medicine. What does it mean? It means matching the right drug with the right patient. And how do we do that? In order to do that, in each individual patient, we identify the knot that is actually driving the cancer. Once we identify that knot, we target this with uh, the most effective drug that is available to us. Sometimes it's not only one drug, but it is a combination of drug that is required so that the patient gets the maximum benefit. What is the advantage of this concept? The advantage, is, uh, the advantage of precision medicine is that not one, two, but majority of the patients or most of the patients will have the maximum benefit that is possible. This brings us finally to our lab, what we do in our day-to-day -day activity. Before we go there, it is important for us to understand how a human body actually functions. So the basic unit of life is cell, which means billions and billions of these cells come together so as to give rise to an organism or a human body. If we look into each of these cells, we have a molecule that is called the DNA. Now this DNA stores all the information about us. Information in the sense how we look, what is the color of our hair? What is the color of our eye? Things like that. Now, because of our day-to-day -day activity, this DNA is constantly getting damaged. Thankfully, we have a system present in our body that is called the DNA damage repair mechanism. What it does, whenever there is a damage in the DNA, DNA damage repair mechanism comes into action. It repairs the DNA and everything is good to go. We are fine. Unfortunately, this is not the case in a cancer cells. In a cancer cell, this DNA damage repair mechanisms fails to work, or in other words, it is non-functional. And this is the reason why this damaged DNA gets accumulated in the cells, finally giving rise to a cancer cell. It is very important to know that most of the cancer cells, in fact, all the cancers, they have this non-functional DNA repair mechanism. So what is the most important message that we take from this slide? That is, DNA damage repair mechanism is a natural phenomenon that is already present in our body. In other words, it is a natural tool that is there in each and every cell of our body that can fight cancer. And we believe that in a cancer cell, if we can overcome this limitation of the damage, DNA damage repair mechanism, uh, by uh, giving effective treatment options like this, we come closer to the cure of cancer and one day we can go reach to the cure of cancer. This is to give you an overview of the working module of our lab or what we do in our day-to-day -day activity. So this is divided into four different steps. In step one, we study the clinical samples, means we identify a problem that exists in the clinic. Let's take the example of breast cancer. So if we see that out of five breast cancer patients, three are responding to the available treatments, but two are not. And then we find that the two patients who are not responding, they have a damaged DNA repair mechanism, but the patients who are responding, they have the right DNA repair mechanism. Once we know this, we come back to the lab. And we validate this hypothesis in the different model systems that is available to us. The next step is, to identify the right treatment or to come up with a solution. Say for instance, we find that we need to block protein A that can slow down the growth of cancer, but we need to block both protein A as well as protein B. And when we do that, the cancer is dead. I mean, the tumor cells, are, tumor cells die. Once we know this, the next step is to go to the clinic because we are a translational biology lab. So our main goal is to go to the clinic as fast as possible so that the patients can get the maximum benefit. In order to do that, we actively collaborate with clinicians, with uh, MDs, so as to identify the right patient groups where we can run the clin uh, clinical trials. So I'll be covering uh, briefly the step one, that is the study of clinical information by giving an example of how we study large clinical data to overcome the challenge of drug resistance that is the most, uh, that is the biggest challenge that we have today or we face in the field of cancer. So there is a long-standing uh, question in the field of breast cancer that although 
the incidence of breast cancer is more or less same between black patients as well as with uh, that in white patients. Nevertheless, if we look into the outcome, it is very different. So if six out of 10 patients, uh, white patients actually respond to the treatment, it's only three out of 10 black patients who are responding to the treatment. We don't know why, but this actually drew our attention and we wanted to know why is this difference. When we studied the clinical samples, we found that the DNA damage repair proteins are differentially expressed between white patients with breast cancer compared to black patients with breast cancer. On this slide, if we see the DNA damage repair proteins in white patients is just shown by the red dots, but in the black patients, it is not only the red dots, but it is the red dots as the green, green dots, both are important. And this is the reason why the standard of care works very differently between the white patients as well as the black patients. So what was the goal of this conducting this um, study? Our main goal was to draw the attention of the scientific community towards the fact that the diagnostics that we have today in the clinics that is used to predict how a patient is going to respond to the available treatment is not the right one. To be very precise, it the diagnostics that we have today is not the right one that can be used to predict how a black woman with breast cancer would respond to the available standard of care. Our next goal would be to validate this hypothesis in the different model systems. So now uh, Sinam is going to come and she is going to present uh, her research and she is going to cover the other uh, steps of the module. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aleron. Before we get to Sinem, a couple of questions. And uh, again, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Um, but this is already you know, pretty fascinating. We're looking at, in your lab, in looking at large groups of data, you're looking at not only um, potential treatments for the disease, but diagnostics as well. Is that correct? Yes. So what we're trying to say is that uh... The diagnostics is very important because that is the first step that is involved when we are trying to get the right treatments for the patients. And these diagnostics are based upon different biomarkers that we say basically that are the proteins or the, like I mentioned in my presentation, the right knots that we need to identify for each individual patients. And if we look into, this is not very defined or well-defined for the black patients with breast cancer. So we need to identify these right biomarkers for this uh, group of patients. A uh, question has come up. We're looking at the difference between uh, white and African-American. What about other ethnicities? Someone asked specifically about Asians. Yeah, so that is also important that it, like uh, maybe in Asian group, it is very, very, it is uh, completely, we need a different set of biomarkers. And that's the idea that whenever we are trying to uh, get a right uh, data sets that we need to include patients from different ethnicity and as well as the groups. And it, it looks like there might be some molecular factors that are part of this racial disparity. Is that the case? Are they lifestyle factors? What's what do so we think the reasons is? Yes, so definitely the socioeconomic as well as the lifestyle, lifestyle factors, they contribute a lot. But the more and more we get into the studies, uh, we see that the molecular, prof I mean, the molecular drivers or the biomarkers are very different between uh, different ethnicities. So it is very important to identify those. And do we have any current diagnostics that can account for these Yes, so... So the current diagnostics that we have, say for instance, for breast cancer, it is the PAN-50 uh, that is used. This is, design, this is uh, designed based upon the information that we got from mainly uh, the patients that are coming from uh, like Caucasians or the white uh, patients. So this is, not, this is not giving us the exact uh, idea of how it is going to work for different group of patients. So this is important. I mean, your work is very important because you're discovering we, <clears throat> excuse me, without this work, we wouldn't know that there were these kind of disparities. And so now you can look again, not only at treating it, but saying we need to design a better diagnostic test for this. Exactly. 
Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Aloran. We will bring you back at the end for, uh, for more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we have Sinem Punturi. Sinem is a research assistant in the Harisharan lab in the Tumor Microenvironment and Cancer Immunology Program. Her area of science is metastatic disease development in breast cancer patients. Sinem, thank you for joining us all the way from Turkey. Please tell us about your research. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Jeff. There you go. And of course, thank you for inviting us to share our work today. So in this presentation, I will be focusing on one of our projects where we study the DNA damage repair and its role in metastatic breast cancer development specifically. So this project is a step right now. And as Ellen explained earlier, at this step, we are trying to find right model systems to mimic metastatic breast cancer development in the patients and validate our hypotheses. And I'm going to talk about what is our hypothesis for uh, this project in the upcoming slides. But first, I just wanted to give uh, a little bit background. So every year we actually lose 15% of the patients diagnosed with breast cancer. And vast majority of these deaths are caused by metastatic disease. And three out of 10 women with metastatic cancer or who are breast cancer survivor will develop metastatic disease. Unfortunately, five out of seven women with metastatic breast cancer won't survive longer than five years after their diagnosis. At earlier stages of this study, we analyzed the breast cancer patient data to see how DNA damage deficiencies affect metastatic disease development. And the results show that two out of these five patients who cannot survive longer than five years have DNA damage repair deficiency. Since data show that patients with DNA damage repair deficiencies appear more in metastatic breast cancer patients with poorer survival, we hypothesize that breast cancer cells that are unable to repair their DNA damage may have higher ability to metastasize. To be able to understand how the breast cancer cells that can't repair DNA damage become metastatic and how can we target these type of cells, first we need to understand what metastasis is. So how does metastasis occur? Breast cancer cells that lies inside the breast tissue surrounded by blood vessels to have an access to nutrients. Some of these cells can have the ability to move uh, or they may gain this ability through throughout the course of the disease and make their way to circulation by using the surrounding blood vessels as a bridge. They change their structure to squeeze themselves through the walls of the blood vessels. And once they make it to the circulation, they can travel to the distant organs by using this transportation system. And again, they use their abilities to move and squeeze out of the blood vessels and start habiting distant organs. So we call this process metastasis. So for breast cancer cells, there are four main target organs, liver, bone, brain, and lungs. And this depend on the type of breast cancer that developed in the breast tissue. And how do we study metastasis in our lab? As I mentioned earlier, according to patient data, we hypothesize that breast cancer cells that are unable to repair their DNA damage may have higher ability to metastasize. So then we need to test this hypothesis in the lab by using cancer cells that are obtained from breast cancer patients. And then we engineer these breast cancer cells in the lab to resemble biopsies of patients whose breast cancer cells cannot repair DNA damage. And then we grow these cells on a breast tissue-like environment and observe their growth. So when we look at these cells under the microscope, we saw the cells which can repair their DNA damage look well-defined, they have smooth circular geometry, and they don't have protrusions. What you see in here is actually mass of cells that make up the tumor. So we usually observe this type of mass of cells in the patients who have less aggressive breast cancer. On the other hand, when we look at the mass of cells that cannot repair DNA damage, 
they are not well defined. They don't have smooth circular geometry and protrusions are coming out of the main body actually. And these protrusions are the results of changing their shape to squeeze through the blood vessels, as well as holding on to the surrounding environment to pull themselves towards the direction they want to move like a caterpillar. And let's take a look at them in the cellular level. So here on the right hand side, what you, we see is individual breast cancer cells. Their main body is colored with blue dye and the outer shape is colored with green dye for visualization of the complete structure of the cell. As you can see, the cells that can repair the damaged DNA are again circular, they are well-defined and they're like pebbles. So it won't be easy for them to move or pass through narrow paths where the ones that cannot repair the DNA have elongated arms coming out of them to help them move. And you may recognize how, how slim they are compared to the cells on the left. And this slimness gives them the advantage to pass through the blood vessel walls. So we all know that our cells in the body have ability to heal the wounds and scars. And this healing process occurs by closing the gap of the wound. Cancer cells also have this ability. However, the more metastatic they become, they close the gap faster. So we assess their movement speed by making this physiological wound healing property in the lab environment. So we plate cancer cells and let them grow until they cover the whole plate so they resemble tissue in the body. And then we create a wound in the middle and then we monitor the cells over time to see how fast that they can uh, close this wound. And as you can see, the cells that can repair DNA damage, they close the gap uniformly. And compared to the cells that cannot repair damage, they still have a lot long ways to go. So this shows us that actually the cells cannot repair damage. They're closing the gap a lot faster and they're not doing this process uniformly. So this shows they have more motile, so they have higher metastatic potential actually. So since we established that these cells are more motile, then we need to see if, if they can really squeeze through the wall as we predicted based on their shape. So for this, uh, to be able to understand this uh, phenomenon, we need to use different types of assays, but today I'm going to explain one of them. So first we plate the cells on top of a gel-like material inside of a chamber to resemble breast tissue. And you can see that gel-like material here more clearly. And then we insert the chamber on the dish filled with medium, which resembles the blood vessels. There are really narrow holes at the bottom of this inner chamber, which resembles bl uh, blood vessel walls. And then we test if these cells are able to squeeze through the gel, like moving through the breast tissue, and squeeze through the holes at the bottom of the chamber, like they will squeeze through the blood vessel walls, and then reach to the bottom of the dish, like traveling to the bloodstream. And what we observe is that the cells cannot repair the damage of the DNA, as we predicted previously, that they can change their shape, they can squeeze through the gel in here, and they can reach the bottom of the dish by using these elongations. So in overall, we can say these experiment results show that our initial hypothesis was correct. The breast cancer cells that cannot repair DNA damage have higher potential potential to develop metastatic disease. So for the future steps of this uh, project, we will be focusing on how can we target metastatic cells by using alternate treatment options to slow down or stop metastatic disease development. And uh, as our ultimate goal, we will take this alternate treatment to the clinic to benefit patients with breast cancer. And in the next, Nindo will be presenting how we tackle step three and step four in more detail. But before that, uh, I can take questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sinem. So the cells that cannot repair their DNA damage mm -hmm. are more likely to elongate, change their shape, and become make it easier to metastasize. Right. Are, are those two, how are those two related, or are they two separate 
processes within the, the cell? Is the, the same thing that's stopping their DNA from repairing also giving them the ability to change their shape? So that's actually one of the mechanistic parts that we are uh, researching in our lab. So there are some, um, I can say evidences that the, the specific DNA damage proteins that we are um, focusing on, they may have actually some contributions to the structural changes of the cell actually. And we, when we actually have some mutations or deficiencies in these um, proteins that help DNA damage repair, we see these changes happening, these shape changes. But of course, to be able to understand if it's exactly a, a kind of like a correlation or direct effect, we have to make, uh, you know, have more studies, actually more detailed studies. Got it. So... But at the same time, I want to make sure we're clear, even cells that do have a correctly working DNA repair mechanism, they can still be cancerous, correct? It is not the DNA yes. repair mechanism that causes a cell to be cancerous or not. Yes. So um, what we see majority of the time when the cells that they have DNA damage repair issues, they become cancerous. This doesn't mean all cancer cells have actually the DNA damage problems, but majority of the time we see that actually this is happening. And for the uh, patients that are having the metastatic disease, we also see the similar results. The ones that they have DNA damage uh, repair issues, they are more metastatic. So they're more likely to metastasize the ones with yes. the correct DNA repair less likely to metastasize. Are they also That's more correct. likely to respond to current standard of care? Uh, that's a really good question. And I think with Nindo's presentation, even we will go deeper in this, but uh, I can say like, yes, the ones that they have DNA damage repair deficiencies, it will be unlikely to respond to standard care of uh, treatment. Um, one last question before we go. So then, we've got two issues, right? We, we've got the cells metastasizing and we're trying mm -hmm. to treat the cancer. So with your studies, are we, are we looking at both or are we trying to um, prevent the metastasis or are we trying to better treat the cells once they metastasize? That's a great question actually. And I can also say both. But um, our main focus is actually when the cells metastasize, how can we slow down for them to grow or even prevent them growing? However, this is not just like one step, it's the whole picture. So one goal is actually to be able to create alternate uh, treatments when the patients are first diagnosed with the breast cancer that the treatments will help them preventing from metastasis. However, for this to happen, the patients need to be diagnosed at the early stages. And uh, you know, for the preventative measures, the issue with metastatic disease, we don't know when it's going to happen. It may take de decades actually. So we can't really tell patients to take, take this treatments 15, 20 years, not knowing if it's going to metastasize or not. And uh, you know, the quality of life of the patient is really important. However, 6% of the patients who are diagnosed with breast cancer, they already present metastatic disease at the first diagnosis. So we have to find treatment for those patients as well. Also, the patients not responding to standard care of treatment, we need to find treatment for those patients. That's the reason I'm saying we are more focusing if metastasis happens, how can we actually slow it down, you know, take under control, even cure that disease. But part of this work may also be to, let's say, prevent the elongation of those cells, which might prevent yes. metastasis. Got yes. It. Super. Sinem, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. We will move on now to Nindo Punturi. And you will notice that Nindo and Sinem have the same last name. That is because they are married and they are both in Turkey. Nindo has been in the Harasharan lab for five years as a research assistant. His research interest is finding alternative therapeutics for ER positive breast cancer. Nindo, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Joe. And also, again, thanks everyone for listening. Um,
as Sinem and Alaron uh, touched on earlier uh, with the, the workflow of the Haracharn lab um, with uh, my presentation, we're gonna be actually focused more on step three. So proposing new treatment regimens, and then we're gonna be transitioning into step four with how our work actually benefits patients. So with starting out with a little bit of statistics with estrogen receptor positive disease, which is the uh, type of cancer that we're gonna be looking at um, throughout this presentation, uh, eight out of 10 patients with breast cancer have estrogen receptor positive disease. So what actually does this mean? Let's first start by uh, understanding what estrogen receptor does in breast tissue. So estrogen receptor is a protein that is made inside of breast cells. We abbreviate it ER. Notice the gray signal coming from ER. The receptor can be activated within the cell as we show with the orange signal. So this is a growth signal that's necessary for development and maintenance of breast tissue. This growth that's triggered by the signal is highly regulated in normal tissue. We say that this type of growth is checked growth. The mechanisms that regulate the growth of breast cells can actually become damaged. When these mechanisms are damaged, the breast cells use the growth signal from estrogen receptor to grow unchecked. So this is what we know as breast cancer. Since ER positive breast cancer cells rely on this signal to grow, we need to turn it off to stop the growth of the tumor. This is where we utilize therapeutics. So standard of care therapies bind to estrogen receptor, stopping the growth signal, and then in turn, stopping the growth of the tumor. Referring back to uh, what Alloran said about the emergence of therapies, this type of treatment targeting estrogen receptor is actually one of the oldest types of selective therapy for ER positive breast cancer. So this type of therapy works in, in most cases, but unfortunately not all cases. When ER positive breast cancers are treatment responsive, stopping the estrogen receptor growth signal alone will cause the tumor to shrink and stop growing. There are also tumors that we define as treatment resistant. So these tumors do not respond to standard of care therapy. Stopping the growth signal of estrogen receptor alone will show minimal, if not any effect on the growth of the tumor. About one in three women with this estrogen receptor positive breast cancer will develop treatment resistant disease. In the Haracharn lab, we study what causes this resistance. And then we try to find treatments the tumor will respond to. We found that when tumor cells can repair their DNA, turning off the growth signal from estrogen receptor alone will stop the growth of this, the tumor. But something very interesting happens in breast cancer cells that cannot repair their DNA. When we turn off the growth signal from estrogen receptor, an entirely different receptor called HER2 replaces the signal with their own. We're then on what we call a therapeutic seesaw. When estrogen receptor emits a growth signal, HER2 does not. Turning estrogen receptor growth signal off with standard of care therapy, HER2 signal then turns on, and this drives the growth of the tumor. To study this phenomenon, we colored the growth signal coming from HER2 with a, with a green fluorescence. We'll then first look at cells that can repair their DNA. So here on the left, we have uh, cells that are in the not treated group. So the estrogen receptor growth signal is on. We do not see the HER2 growth signal. We don't see any green here. And in the treated group, uh, we also do not see the HER2 growth signal. So these cells are entirely dependent on the estrogen receptor growth signal for growth. However, let's look at cells uh, that cannot repair their own DNA. In the not treated group, the estrogen receptor growth signal is on. 
and that's also driving the growth of the tumor. But when we treat these cells by turning off the estrogen receptor growth signal, they then turn on the HER2 growth signal, which is here in green, right? And this instead drives the growth of the tumor. So this brings us to our next question. If these tumor cells can evade standard of care therapy this way, then how do we treat them? How we treat these patients is actually very important. Upon diagnosis, if these tumors are not tested to see if they can repair their DNA, they will be diagnosed as ER positive or two negative and given standard of care therapy. As we saw in our previous slide, this will have minimal effect on stopping the growth as they're using now an entirely different signal to drive the growth of the tumor. So treating these tumors correctly at diagnosis is a necessity for the best overall prognosis. So how do we do this? One, we need to check to see if the cells can repair their DNA, and then we need to break the seesaw. Breaking the seesaw will consist of targeting both ER and HER2. So this is one experiment we did to test our um, alternate treatment option. So we took breast cancer tumors and grew them in a gelatin that resembles breast tissue. We do this so we can study how these tumors will react in the environment they would be if they were inside of the body. The tumors shown growing in the gelatin can not repair their DNA. The picture shown to the left consists of colonies grown without treatment, the, the not treated group. They grow well in the gelatin matrix. They form these large irregular shaped colonies that protrude through the matrix uh, as Sinem was also looking at. As we look at the middle picture, this is the colonies that we treated with standard of care therapy. So we see a small reduction in number of colonies, but they still grew large and irregular shaped. And they also protruded through the matrix. In the last group, this is the group where we broke the seesaw. So we used our alternate treatment option. We treated these with standard of care therapy and HER2 inhibitors. So this treatment significantly decreased the number and size of the colonies. We not only decreased the growth, but we stopped the tumors from growing. So we took what we found and we published this paper. So the information is out to other researchers and clinicians and also the general public. This uh, opens up interdepartmental and interinstitutional collaborations to help you know, drive our findings to the next level. Right, so that next level would be setting up a clinical trial. And this is where we get into step four, going from the bench back to the bedside. Currently, we're working with clinicians, uh, Stephen Shaw at Cedar sinai and Bora Lim at Baylor College of Medicine to establish a clinical trial for patients with this disease. This allows us to match patients with this specific type of breast cancer to our proposed treatment option for the best case of a successful outcome from diagnosis. There are, however, challenges when it, uh, when it comes to getting to this level, uh, specifically three main challenges. Uh, one is getting FDA approval. So that's one challenge that we're able to circumvent by using already FDA approved drugs. The next would be finding collaborators, which, uh, which we are currently working with uh, collaborators. And uh, along with that goes with patient recruitment. So currently there are patients at Cedar sinai that would benefit from this treatment. So patient recruitment, we think will not necessarily be an issue for this. And third is funding the clinical trial. Um, currently, this is, this is one of the points that we're at. Right, so uh, a phase three clinical trial um, has an average cost around $20 million. So uh, securing this funding certainly takes time, but uh, we're, we're definitely hopeful. Thank you all for listening. So this is all the members of the Harcharn Lab. And without all these members, none of this work would, 
certainly be possible. Thank you. Nindo, thank you so much. Uh, I wish my new position paid me an extra $20 million that I could give you to do the uh, phase three trial. Um, working with these targeted therapies and looking at the breast cancer population, what percentage of women would these targeted therapies help? So um, in, in recent years, around 250, I think one of the current is up to 280,000 women uh, per year have estrogen receptor positive disease uh, as a new diagnosis. And uh, each year, treatment resistance occurs in about 30% of, um, of current patients. So that results in around 40,000 deaths. Um, so this uh, type of treatment would it would help around 5% actually of, of, of those patients would, would benefit from this treatment. So around 2000 patients a year. So, you know, it's interesting because I think this is something that with cancer therapies we have to get used to is that some of these treatments are incremental, right? We learn more about a certain type of cell that we can then, or a certain type of damage or a certain type of changes that are going on and we try to attack those, it, it, there's no sort of magic key like, oh, if we do this, we will cure all cancer, right? Because cancer is so heterogeneous that we, we have to get in specifically, it's really thousands of different diseases, right? Oh, correct, correct. And that's why uh, you're saying, you know, targeted therapies are so important because it is, it's one specific key for each specific patient. Now, will this also, I know that there are some other cancers that are also HER2 positive. I believe colon cancers, for example, can have HER2 positive cells. Will this treatment uh, help those patients as well? Um, so with the colorectal patients, you know, I, I've only looked at uh, the breast cancer patients okay. as well, but um, we're, we're currently exploring uh, colorectal patients as well, and, uh, and hopefully we will be able to to see. And then what is, you talked a little about the costs. What's the, the time frame for a study like this? So um, the time frame, so these projects vary uh, in length of time. So the project that I presented took roughly four and a half years to complete. Uh, some take even longer, right? So to, to find something truly novel Scientists definitely have to venture into the unknown with, with no set uh, length or, or path in time. Got it. All right, Nindo, thank you so much. Let's bring everybody back for our Q&A and including uh, our presenters, we're going to bring in Dr. Svasti Harasharan. Svasti is an assistant professor at Sanford Burnham Prebis and has over 10 years of research experience in breast cancer development and treatment response. And as you can also see, she is extremely talented at training brilliant young scientists. Dr. Harsharan's research focus is on the activities of DNA repair proteins in tumor initiation, progression, and treatment response. Svasti, let me actually ask you the, the first question. Um, and again, if you still have questions for our presenters, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. It seems like the DNA repair proteins are sort of the upstream solution to this, that if we can figure out how to repair those, could we prevent some cancers in the first place? I mean, um, it's, it's a great question. And I think I can say with confidence that we're, science in general is still figuring that out. But yes, I think fundamentally, if we could, you know what you were asking, Joe, about how since it's so heterogeneous and there are so many different types of cancer that can sprout up, even in the same patient, when it comes back, it can come back differently or as it grows, it can change. And I think part of the problem with pathways like DNA damage repair is that they are the agent of change in the tumor. And so as the tumor sort of progresses and it lacks DNA damage repair checkpoints, it's becoming more and more and more diverse which makes it harder and harder and harder for the clinician to find proteins that they can target that can kill all the cells in the tumor because you end up only killing a subset of tumor cells, which means the other cells can still come back. 
So as you said the earlier in the process that we can figure out that these cells are DNA damage repair deficient and hit them, like Nindo was saying, break the therapeutic seesaw so that you can stop the evolution of the tumor, the more successful will be. But if, if you don't mind, I would also like to take a step back to sort of comment on what you, you and Sinem were discussing in terms of, you know, what are these DNA damage repair proteins doing, changing the shapes of cells and, you know, turning on growth signals, like what's going on there, right? Like that seems really weird if these are supposed to be repairing DNA damage. They seem to be doing all sorts of strange things in the cells. And so in our lab, we like to talk about the fact that this is partly and largely because even in science, you have this real problem of naming bias. Right. So when we first discovered what we call DNA damage repair proteins, we discovered them by flooding cells with DNA damage. And then we looked to see what proteins changed in response. And then we assumed that that meant those proteins were all primarily involved in DNA damage repair because they were showing up when we damaged the DNA in these cells. But as we learn more about these proteins, we're finding out that, hey, maybe if we had started with a completely different test, maybe if we hadn't damaged the DNA of those cells, we would have found that these proteins are actually proteins that change cell shape, and we would have called them cell shape proteins, and that's what we'd be studying about them now. So one of the fascinating things that we're figuring out is that you kind of have to, like Nindo was saying, you come into the unknown and you have to approach it with an open mind. And, and understand that just because someone previously found that these proteins were involved in DNA repair doesn't mean that that's the end of the story. And I think that's sort of what we're finding out that in fact, it's the beginning of a completely new story of what these proteins are doing in cancer. Is it sort of a chicken and egg thing? Like the DNA damage repair is broken, so that allows them to elongate or they have something else that allows them to elongate, which also breaks the DNA damage? Yeah, their protein? And actually, we don't know. Um, and that's definitely something we're working on. But as you can imagine, even as I'm explaining this to you all, I'm thinking a lot of you are probably feeling a little bit skeptical about what it is we're doing in our labs all day. And you can imagine how much harder it is to convince a panel of ground reviewers that our completely different and unique take on what DNA damage repair proteins is something worth spending millions of dollars on. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a fun and interesting challenge, I think. Isn't that also one of the advantages of publishing your work, though, is that you can get those ideas out there and you can get um, responses from other researchers in the in the in the business, as it were, in the field, telling you, you know, you're on the right track or we found something else and it may be something different. Is that a fair assessment? hundred percent. I think that publishing our work is probably the biggest way of getting the ideas out there. And like you said, making connections where other researchers are then saying, oh yeah, we're seeing something similar and this is real. And the best validation of anything we find in our lab is when someone in a lab in a completely different country working on something completely different says, hey, we found exactly the same thing, which actually happened with some Italian collaborators who are now collaborators of ours. But um, they just independently stumbled upon the same thing and reached out. And now we find we have a lot of things to discuss in common. <laughs> I, I think that's an important point for our audience because a lot of people, uh, lay people always say to me, why can't we just all work together on this? And, and scientists do. And the way you communicate what you're doing to collaborate with other people is by publishing your work and reading what other scientists publish. And it may fit in with what you're doing, or it may send you off in a slightly different direction, and you can you can work with them in that. In that 100%. And I think maybe one day we'll do a completely different insights on all the issues with publication and why it takes us <laughs> so long to publish our data, which it should not. <laughs> um, but thankfully, you know, now that we do things like preprint, which I think some of the lay audience might not know, is a new way that scientists are discovering amongst themselves, almost as a sort of grassroots movement to share our data with each other without having to spend three years or four years going through a peer review system, is that we can upload it onto a large database that any scientist, any person really, any, any, anyone who has connection to the internet can find and read about our findings, which at the end of the day, they are taxpayer money that's paying for these findings. And so they should be open and available to anyone who wants to read about them, right? And um, so I think things are changing and it's an evolving landscape that's quite interesting. But like I said, that's a different insights and we won't go into that today. Um, uh, I want to sort of throw this question out to each of, of our presenters because 
Nindo, you threw out the $20 million figure. And, and I know that, you know, we have some people, we have lots of supporters online, but, you know, nobody has $20 million lying around. <laughs> um, taking that figure out, and we'll start with Nindo and then go to CNM and then Aleron. The, the next steps in your research, I assume you don't need 20 million to do the next thing. What would you need to do sort of the next immediate steps in your research? Um, well, I guess I can start out by saying, you know, anything really helps. <laughs> um, uh, so with, uh, since we're talking about figures, um, I think with the uh, HER2 paper that I, that I presented, uh, that was around two to three million. And that was, like I said, about a four and a half uh, year long project, right? So uh, it, it is, uh, it's less expensive to fund bench work, which, which we need. But um, unfortunately, we're a translational biology lab and we're doing this for the patients. So we want to get this to the patients, right? Right. <clears throat> Sinem, what about you? Um, I can see for my work, since it's uh, kind of like at the first stages right now, just to be able to complete the bench work part, I can also say two to three million. Um, I believe that we have really good preliminary results actually showing that the DNA damage is um, causing to have a higher metastatic potential, but we still have a lot to do you know, like the work and research on, especially to be able to find uh, new alternate treatments actually for this. And that's going to be more expensive, just testing and seeing how these uh, cells doing, because now we need to include drugs into the picture, as well as we are working actually with new type of treatments, which is even a little bit more expensive to be able to develop a specific, uh, you know, drug, and then taking that to the even taking a lot longer. So we are kind of working like a parallel. While we are using the FDA approved drugs, we are also developing, uh, like collaborating within SBP to develop specific uh, targeted treatments. So I can say maybe two, three million for FDA approved drugs and that type of research. And I don't know how much it will be cost actually to create the targeted treatments. Aloran, how about you? Yeah, I think it's more or less same. I'll go with the same figure like Nindo and Sinem. But I think that it also depends upon how, how far we want to go ahead with our findings. The reason being that, as Nindo and Sinem explained, that it's two to three million uh, just to reach a level where we can uh, present our idea or our finding to the scientific community. And the main challenge starts from that end because now it's time where we want to take this uh, to the clinics. So yeah, I mean, it's more what, how, whatever contribution comes to the lab is definitely helpful for our day-to-day -day activity. Okay. Sinem, a question from our audience that I think might be in your area. Once the patient has had breast cancer, is there then a test to see DNA damage and repair um, abilities for the future? For the colorectal cancers, ovarian cancers at the diagnostic stage, it's standard to check if there is, especially this specific type of DNA damage, uh, dysfunction is already present or not. This is already a standard diagnosis. What we are trying to do with our research, actually take this diag like standard diagnosis for breast cancer patients as well. So they can be tested. Uh, they can have genetic as well, just to see that if they have any uh, mutations or deficiencies, again, for the DNA damage repair proteins, they can discuss with their doctors. But right now, it's not standard Got to it. check those. Yeah. Got it. Uh, Nindo, uh, will there be any clinical trials initiated in San Diego? Um, so, oh, sorry, Swasti. Um, so uh, in LA, we're working with Cedar sinai Mm -hmm. So uh, not necessarily San Diego, but, but certainly very close. Got it. And then as we are coming up on two o'clock and to be respectful of everybody's time, let's uh, end with this. Um, 
Someone typed in, Svasti, being a breast cancer survivor, you constantly hold out hope that science will prevail in this fight. What advice would you give to survivors to help stay positive? I think Aloran sort of described it best. I think I see nothing but optimism. I think every day we're making new breakthroughs. And I think the new generation, or at least my generation of researchers, I think we take very seriously the fact that we are not studying cells in a petri plate or figuring out how to cure mice for breast cancer. We know that the end goal is to change lives. So a lot of the work we do, and in some ways going back to the funding, the reason we have always an uphill task with getting funding is uh, some of the, the approaches we take seem a bit non-traditional. Like we look at things that are nutraceuticals or we look at things that um, uh, 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 I think the previous generation of scientists might not have taken seriously, but it's also because we realize that quality of life is as important as having a cure. And I think a lot of us are still holding out hope for an actual cure, not just prolonging survival for a few months and et cetera, et cetera, but actually having something that's going to break it completely so you never have to worry about it again. And that's a dream still but I think we're much closer to that dream being fulfilled, at least for some patients, and then we'll keep increasing the group of patients till, till, till it's true for everyone. And I think I'm really optimistic and, and hopeful that we're at the point where we have all the data we need um, to push through. And I feel like it's an inflection point in cancer research. So there's, there's all possible hope for optimism here. Well, unfortunately, we have wonderful researchers like yourself and uh, the folks in your lab who did a fantastic job today. And thank you, all of you, all of our speakers, and thank you all, everybody who joined us. As always, our uh, presentation was recorded and will be emailed to everyone who registered. We so appreciate that you take an active role in learning about our research. Please feel free to share this with others who might be interested in this work. You can learn about our other research at future Insight events, and uh, we will put up a list of those that are coming up in the next few months. And also, if you would like to learn more about supporting our research or would like to contribute to the work that Svasti's team and others here are doing, please reach out to the contact information on your screen. Again, thank you all for tuning in and for giving me the opportunity to share this research with you. Thank you for attending today. And again, feel free to share with your friends and colleagues. And thank you for your interest in our science. Bye.